Good morning, saints. Today is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. My name is Crystal Logan, and welcome to the Perimeter Point Church Worship Experience. I am delighted to lead us in worship today, but first, a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we just thank you, Lord, for yet another day where you have gifted us life, Lord, where new grace and new mercy await us, Lord. We just thank you that your unfailing love loved the world so much that you gave your only begotten son. And Jesus, we thank you for your sacrifice. Because you hung, bled, and died on that cross, we are saved and we are thankful. We are thankful for the strength that you give us, Lord. Through you, we can do all things because you strengthen us. We thank you for the peace that you gifted us as you ascended into heaven and the comforter that you left behind in the Holy Spirit. And Holy Spirit, we thank you for conviction. We thank you for discernment and for spiritual guidance. Today, Lord, we just ask that you feel this place that you just touch every mind and every heart, Lord. And I just ask that everyone under the sound of my voice simply just lay all of their burdens at your feet because your burdens are light. Cast all of our anxieties on you because you care and just believe that your word will do exactly what it says that you will do. Believe that you are in fact the great I am and just allow you to work miracles in our lives individually and as a group. And today, we just come to lift up your holy name. We come to worship you. We come to praise you, Lord. And we are going to do all of these things with the spirit of hope, expectancy, and in the sweet name of Jesus, amen. It's working for me. It's working. 
working for me. Somebody say, I don't have to worry cause it's working for me. Yeah, it's working for me. It's working for me. I don't have to worry cause it's working for me. I need to encourage you right now to make sure that you like and share this message today. And after that song, I'm compelled even the more. You know, some of us, we need to just declare to ourselves today, enough bad news. I know that resonates with somebody's heart that, man, things have been just coming after you one thing after another, but we need to declare enough bad news. And, you know, sometimes we get to this point where it just seems like, you know, when are things going to turn around? But you have to also realize that all things, like the song says, are working for your good. How many of you know we serve an intentional God? I know there's been a lot of things coming against you and coming against our world right now. But that song reminds us that all things are working for our good. Does anybody get that this morning? Has anybody seen that as a reality in their lives throughout their lifetime following God. You know, all things are working for my good. You know what somebody else needs to do in this place besides sharing this and doing a watch party and all that good stuff? You need to declare to yourself enough bad news. Come on, get that in your spirit and let's speak it out loud. Enough bad news. Come on, one more time. Enough bad news. Why am I having you repeat that? Because we're taking in way too much negativity right now. Come on, be honest about it. How much are we taking in the good things of God and, and the promises of God that are prompting us to even praise God more and thank God more and meditate on his word? Or how much are we letting so much negativity in from the things that are happening in our world? They're serious things. We've been talking about them on a regular basis as a church. But at some point, we've got to realize that that stuff can really start to bring down our spirit. So I want you to get it in your spirit even right now. Enough bad news. Enough bad news. I'm not going to take it in. I'm going to declare like that song says that I serve an intentional God and he's working it for my good. You know, it kind of reminds me of King David a man after God's own heart. I remember this great psalm in Psalm 34. He was on the run from King Saul. He was in another foreign country. And even there, there was another king that was hot on his trail and wanted to see him, you know, see him dead and see him out of his country. And it seems like David was constantly dealing with one thing after another. But then he penned this psalm, Psalm 34. And this is what I want you to get in your spirit when you say enough bad news. You see, you can't just say enough bad news and declare that, you know, no more. I'm not allowing it in. I'm not going to keep focusing on that stuff. What you need to do is replace it with something else. And what David did in every situation that was filled with heartache and drama and trials, and he could have just let his mind go there constantly. No, he said enough bad news, even when he was facing a whole bunch of stuff. It says in Psalm 34, he says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praises shall continually be in my mouth. In other words, David kept on praising God just because of a passion for who he was. He said, I praise him at all times. It was regardless of his circumstances. Do you have that kind of praise even with all the stuff that's going on in your life and in our world? You've got to say enough bad news. I'm going to praise God anyhow. I'm going to praise God knowing that he is on my side. 
He is working it for my good. He's intentional even about what I'm going through. But not only do we see that David, you know, he prays God regardless of the circumstances, but he prays God because he recognized how God provided for him at his most desperate point of need. Every time he said, I sought the Lord and he heard me and he delivered me from all of my fears. You know, here's the thing is that when we say enough bad news, well, let's praise God, expecting him to do some good stuff for us, expecting him to move some of those mountains for us, expecting him to change some of those attitudes of people around us. You know, we got to say enough bad news and then we praise God for who he is. And we praise God because he provides for us at our most desperate point of need. David said, you know, I sought the Lord and he heard me and he delivered me from all my fears. Got anything that you're anxious or fearful of? Got anything that you feel like it's not going to turn around? Well, you know what? Until you say enough bad news and start speaking life into that situation, you know, you're just going to continue to feed that negativity to a point where you become immobilized and don't start moving forward in what God has ordained for you to do and to have and to walk in. And David, he said enough bad news. How did he say it? He said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to praise God because I recognize who he is. I'm going to praise God regardless of my circumstances. And I'm going to praise God because he provides for me at my most desperate point of need. But you know what I'm also going to do? I'm going to praise God so that others start praising with me. That's essentially what he says later on in the psalm. He says, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed are they who put their trust in him. You see, we can say enough bad news and believe it and declare it and walk in it. Because when we look at things through God's perspective, that he's intentional and that he's working it for our good, and then we take the proper perspective, knowing that everything we face is in his hands, I don't know what you're facing today, but some of you need to say to yourself, self, I'm coming out of this. Come on, say it with me. Self, I'm coming out of this. You know, like the song says, it's working for my good. Enough bad news. Come on, one more time. Self, it's working for my good. If you didn't get anything else from what I've said so far, you ain't coming out of this thing completely until you learn to praise God because of a passion for who he is. Learn to praise God because he provides for your most desperate point of need and praise God to prompt others to do the same. Come on, this is how we fight our battles. We fight our battles with our praise and we declare that things are going to turn around. We say enough bad news, but the way that we walk in victory is through our praise. This is how we fight our battles and it is in our praise. Come on, get a hold of that and praise God until you see the breakthrough. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles.
is how I fight my battle. This 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 is how I fight. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. This is how I fight my battle. This is how I fight my battle. This is how I fight my battle. Father God, we just come to you right now just giving your name all the praise and honor and glory. We know, God, that there is someone who has been fighting an uphill battle for a long time, and I just feel prompted to stand in the gap for them, God. When, when, when their heart is overwhelmed, your word says, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. We are putting our confidence, our faith, and trust in you. We are declaring for that person right now that is struggling, God, that they're going to praise you through this storm, that they are declaring enough is enough, that they're walking toward their destiny, walking toward their promise, that they are walking toward their future. And you are an intentional God that is working everything for their good. God, would you just strengthen them right now? And God, would you just put on their heart the ability to praise you anyhow? God, because I know that when you continue to guide them and you continue to direct them, they will look back on this situation and see that you never left them and that your, your hand of wisdom and guidance and favor was with them every single step of the way. So God, wherever they may find themselves right now, be their strength where they're weak. Help them to have joy where there may be sorrow. Give them a garment of praise like we've been talking about for the spirit of heaviness. I know they're struggling perhaps to lift their hands in worship and to bow their knees in prayer or even to get into your, to your word. But I'm praying for a fresh spirit filled life that will, that will just, your spirit will come upon them and lift them up to where they are drawn closer to you again. Even in this moment, Lord, they're lifting hands. Even in this moment, they're crying out. Even in this moment, they're seeking for you. Even now, they're realizing they can't win this battle unless they worship you. They can't win this battle unless they get into the throne room, that place where, you know, no one knows about except that person and you. When they get to that point of total surrender, as they get to that point of brokenness, as they get to that point of, I'm going to worship you even in the storm. I'm going to praise you even in my struggle. I'm going to praise you even when I feel like throwing in the towel. When we can get into that secret place, you said, he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. When we get into that secret place, we're protected. When we get into that secret place, no one can touch us. When we get into that secret place, there is joy unspeakable that 
we can walk out of that time in triumph and victory. When we get into that secret place, we know that you're right there with us, God. We know that we can go through any trial, any obstacle, any challenge that we face. When we get into that secret place, but some of us have had a hard time, so bring us even now into that secret place. Because in your presence is fullness of joy. In your presence is pleasures forevermore. I don't know who I'm speaking to right now, God, but they're not digging their heels in like they should. They're just listening to this as if it's normal church online and I can sit and sip my coffee. Someone needs to take this and press into the throne room. Someone needs to take this and get into the presence of Abba Father. Someone needs to be reminded what it means to earnestly seek you. Someone needs to know that you can't just sometimes give this this half-hearted devotion, but we need to press our way into your presence this morning. Someone needs to shake off the dust from their feet and leave that person behind that's been giving them such a heartache. Someone else needs to press in and forgive that person and move on and stop worrying about the things that happened in the past that you have no control over. Some of us need to start declaring that things are getting better. Start, stop looking at the circumstances and keep looking at our Father who is watching and knows the best for our lives. Help us, Holy Father, to trust in you with all of our heart. Lean not unto our own understanding, but in all our ways acknowledge you and you will direct our path. Lord, I'm just believing right now that someone here has enough sense in this moment that this wasn't by accident that they're with us. It is by divine appointment. And I pray that they'd have the faith as I do to lift my hands unto the only one that can help me through my storm, unto the only one that can get me through this impossible situation, unto the only one that can heal my broken heart, unto the only one that can help make a way in this horrific situation that looks impossible to get through. You are the only one. And in faith, we look to you with, with hands lifted. We pray that you would just move, Father. Move in our situation. Move in our struggles. Move in our heartache. Give us wisdom and insight and direction. And we go forth declaring enough bad news, it's working for my good. And an intentional God who we worship, who we praise, is working and is on my side. And he'll bring me to victory and a wide open plain, which is filled with, 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 with freedom and joy and confidence and courage and victory. Whatever it is that I brought to this service, it is done. I lay it down because my God shall supply all of my needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. We have the victory and we declare it done in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Well, God bless each and every one of you. And if you need to take a little bit more time, we're going to keep moving forward with the service. But if you need to run around the house, if you need to go get your shout on somewhere and keep flowing in that to get your breakthrough, I'm just saying, do what you got to do sometimes. Press your way into him. Somebody's been blocked for whatever reason. The devil is a liar. You need to press your way through and get into that throne room, the very presence of the Almighty God, where he can meet you there and then start giving you the step-by-step-by-step -step -step instructions to get to the other side of what you're dealing with. And if you need more encouragement and you need to connect, you know, that's where we're going with this message today, why belong to a church? Well, I'd love to serve as your pastor. I'll give the invitation early on today. If you need a church, I tell you, everyone needs a church. Everyone needs a pastor. Everyone needs a church family. That's the whole point of this message today. But you know what? Before I even share this message, I think you already know you were brought here, not by accident, but it's time to get connected with a local church. And you know when you found your church, when you found your pastor. I've always discovered that God will knit me up with somebody, someone to journey with. I still have three pastors that I consider great influential people and even 
even spiritual fathers in my life because it is about a spiritual connection all throughout scripture, and we'll even talk about it today, that God ordained people to walk alongside us and people to pull us up to get where God wants us. So if God is speaking to you, why wait till the end of the service? Why don't you just say, I'm, I'm connecting right now before, before we even get going? God has spoken to somebody today, and you need to click that connect with us and say, I'm joining this church. That simple. I know that I normally do this near the end, but I just feel like I'm supposed to do it right now. Do you need a local church? Is it time for you to get a little bit more serious about faith and growing in Christ? And about being encouraged by other believers and having a, a, a pastor to, to guide you and encourage you? Well, let's do this now. Connect with us, fill that out, and we'll follow up with you. In fact, I'll personally follow up with you this Sunday if you reach out to me. And we'll give you some next steps to go from there, okay? Well, listen, there's a special day upon us, and I want you to check out this brief video. I can think of at least one person that's watching this right now and they're thinking, oh my goodness, that is just not the proper grilling technique. You never use lighter fluid on a barbecue. Can I get an amen, Greg? But I tell you, uh, happy Father's Day, happy Father's Day, happy Father's Day to all the brothers out there that are fathers, father figures, mentors, uh, to young men, I applaud you. I celebrate you. In fact, if somebody is in there and you got a dad in your midst, a uh, uh, father figure, you need to give them some props right now. Give them a high five. Put it in the chat box. Happy Father's Day. Call them out by name. Celebrate the fact that there are some dads doing it God's way. In fact, the scripture that comes to mind for me is Proverbs 14, 26. It says, whoever fears the Lord has a secure fortress. And for their children, it will be a refuge. Not sure if you caught that, but it says, those who fear the Lord, those who have a reverence for God, those who take their walk with God seriously, it becomes a protection, not only for them, because the Lord is encamping around them and protecting them, but did you see that it says it's for their children, a place of refuge, a place to hide in the midst of the storm, a place of safety, a place of comfort, did you see that as long as the, the father is making this place a, a fortress because of their fear of the Lord, that's what fathers do. And then their children will be finding that it is a refuge for them as well. And I want to say how much I appreciate the fathers of Perimeter Point Church, but also other fathers and mentors, people who have influenced me, others who are my peers that hold me accountable. Listen, I thank God for you. I thank God for you and I honor you. Sometimes we don't give enough props for all that you do. You carry a lot of different loads, a lot of different responsibilities, a lot of different burdens. And some of them, let's be real, you carry them on your shoulders and nobody else knows because that's part of what it means to be a father. You are to be celebrated today, man of God. And I personally honor you. I want to tell you, you know, I say this to, to the moms on Mother's Day. I say, hey, Get everything you can on Mother's Day. You know, go get the brunch. Make sure they get you flowers or whatever it is that you like. Hook it up for moms on Mother's Day. I always say that. That's the last thing I say, probably even after the benediction. But here's why I say it. Because Father's Day is right around the corner. So what I'm saying is, is that right now, anybody who has a father that they can think of right now, what are you planning? <laughs> it's time to hook up the dads here. It's time to be a blessing. Let's figure it out. Pull out all the stops, all right? And let's honor dads appropriately. Man, I thank God for each of you brothers, and please connect more and more with this church. We also have a Group Me app, as you know, where actually it's a, it's a, it's a men's group that we connect with, and it, it needs to be built up. I'm hoping some of our men in our church will help 
uh, lead that effort and just get more men engaged with that. But we need to celebrate each other as men. We need to we need to encourage each other as men. I think there's enough negativity that often goes out there about men that we need to find ways, especially like today, to celebrate. So happy, happy Father's Day. Well, you know, what we're going to do now is get into the second uh, lesson of our new members class. <laughs> Some of you are like, new members class? What? Yep. We're teaching on why should I belong to a church. And last week we talked about baptism. These are courses that are going to be a part of our membership class for those that want to go from attending the church regularly or even attending on occasion to what we'll discover today is a deeper commitment to the local church that's outlined in scripture. I'm praying that, you know, God will tug people's hearts, those that he wills to, to join this local church, Perimeter Point Church, and perhaps he'll speak to your heart. So you might even want to, again, share this with others that you know don't necessarily have a church home or maybe haven't been that committed 
to regular assembly now, especially with COVID-19. Well, it's difficult to, to stay motivated online or whatever. Well, if you learn about churches like Perimeter Point, you'll see that there's not just one gathering. There's 14, 19, 20, 20. There's like 23 opportunities to get involved online throughout the week if you include everything. Plus, you can get on the phone and all that other good stuff. I'm talking about the structured things. Did you know that? We have a lot of ways to connect as a church, even while we're not meeting in person. That's going to come in God's timing, but right now, you got to get plugged in. So I hope that you'll stay tuned to this message. And for those that are considering membership at Perimeter Point, this is basically lesson two. I hope you got a chance to catch last week's. Take a look at baptism. We should all know what that's about. Whether you've been baptized or not, that's a great refresher. I really want to encourage you. But hey, let's go ahead and uh, jump into this next lesson. We want to talk today about why belong to a church. And when you hear that, you know, you might be asking yourself, well, of course I belong to the church. I mean, I, I'm, I'm a participant at Perimeter Point Church. Well, what does that participation look like for you? Is it, is it something where you find yourself regularly involved? Is it something where you, you know, you keep connected with people? Or is it something that you know that you can turn to kind of when things get rough, which is a good thing? Or maybe it's just something that kind of, it's on the periphery there. Um, I, I kind of jump in and out when I can. I understand there's different levels of um, of right now, even interest in a church with everything going on. And, and, and the reality is, is you've got so many other things you're trying to juggle, right? So I understand, you know, it's tough. But I'm hoping at the end of this message, once we finish talking about why belong to a church, that wherever you find yourself, you'll kind of etch up from there and maybe even not just take one step but maybe even take the plunge, all right? Not just speaking of baptism, but just a deeper level of commitment to your faith in Christ, which in part comes through a faithful commitment to the local church. But here's the thing I want to start off with. Is membership, church membership, is it a biblical idea? I mean, what you might ask is, show me somewhere in the Bible where it says, thou shalt take new members class to join a church. And you might even be thinking, you know, this isn't a country club. I don't need to be a member. I mean, this is, this is a church where everyone is welcome, right? Well, I think you're right to an extent. It is open to everyone uh, that wants to gather and wants to explore faith in Christ and wants to come and be encouraged. Of course, anyone is welcome to the local church, of course. But when you look at it a little bit longer, you'll see that there are, even with how Jesus preached to the masses, the crowds. He slowly but surely scared away the masses because of what was required to follow him. And it kind of funneled down and down and down until he had the core group of committed followers that were dedicated. Didn't use the term member, but were dedicated, committed followers of Christ. And in today's age, as I break down these texts, See if it implies in a very strong way the reason for having membership as a part of a local church. Don't, don't run away just yet. Let me give you some insight, okay? I need, you to, I need you to buckle up and let's go through some scriptures that, to me, clearly validate the need for us that are committed to growing in our faith and going deeper, the need for us to become members, let me give you the first one right out of the box. 1 Corinthians 12, verses 12 and 13. It says, For as the body is one and has many parts, and all the parts of that body, though many, are one body, so also is Christ. For we are all baptized by one spirit into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free. And we are all made to drink of one spirit. Now, Paul goes in further after those couple of verses. He gives the illustration of the church being like a physical body. He starts talking about each one of us, you know, has different spiritual gifts. And he says that the local church can be likened to a body, you know, where, you know, one person has this gifting. Another person has this gifting. One has, like a, a body works as the hand, 
Another works as a foot. Another works as a shoulder, head, neck, whatever it is. He says, when you have all of those different parts with people of different gifts and abilities coming together and working effectively, you have a healthy body that is able to accomplish great things. But here's the problem and why it is so important to talk about every member of the body being in position is because think about the last time you broke your big toe. I can remember when I did it, I had one of those little black boot Velcro things that I wore with a sock and I had to limp around. It was not easy to get around just because of a little break in my big toe. Now imagine if you broke an arm and a leg and your pinky and your shoulder, your collarbone, and you're trying to get around and just navigate fine and do everything business as usual. Sad to say, because we don't put any level of accountability, any level of requirement or expectation on people in today's uh, church shopping and hopping, because we are consumers looking for what we want to get from church, what ends up happening is there is no health in a body because no one is noticing how critical their arm is to the body. Knowing how if you're missing an eye in the body, it can't see clearly. Do you see where I'm going with this? So if you don't have the members of the body together, you can never have a healthy local church. Look at what God says about having leaders. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 2, it says, Shepherd God's flock among you, not overseen out of compulsion, but freely, according to God's will, not for the money, but eagerly. Notice what it says. It says, shepherd God's flock among you, which suggests that a pastor or an elder, as the scripture calls about it in 1 Peter chapter 5, is one who shepherds the flock or leads the flock among them, the ones that are that he is responsible for. Do you see? God is going to hold shepherds accountable. You know, if you look at it further, if you need any incentive or understanding about membership, I'll say it as a pastor how much it would help if people would really get some of these concepts. It's right there in Acts chapter 20, verse 28. It says, be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock, speaking to pastors again, for all the flock that the Holy Spirit has appointed you to as overseers. There is a group of people that have been appointed to the shepherd, the overseer, right? To shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. Is the shepherd accountable? Yes. Is it for a certain amount of people? Yes, it is for God's flock among us, and it is for the ones that have been appointed to us as overseers. You see that? There's, there's, there's a direct correlation to who he has uh, charged us with overseeing and those that are accountable to those that have been charged with shepherding them, leading them, teaching them, guiding them. In fact, it says in Hebrews 13 and 17 that there's not only a pastor role, an elder role, a shepherd role, but there is a member role, a follower role. Look at what it says. It says, obey your spiritual leaders. I know that half of the people click. <laughs> obey your spiritual leaders and do what they say. Their work is to watch over your souls. And they are accountable to God. Do you see that this is not some haphazard, casual relationship? He will have to give an account. And likewise, as we'll see later on, how you as a, as a, as a person, a part of a local church, will have to give an account for how you've used your gifts. And look at what it says in 1 Peter 4 verse 10. It says, each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. Do you see every member is a part of a body? You personally have gifts that you're to steward. And then it says that you're to be accountable, to follow the leadership of the one who God has assigned to pastor you, to shepherd you. And then it says, even goes on, that you're not only accountable, but as you 
follow the leader. As you do what they say, as the scripture says, give them a reason to do it with joy and not with sorrow. I know how much God has ordained in his word for you to be a fully active, contributing, connected member of the body, the local church. And so when you're out there, it grieves the leader. One who is doing it willingly, not under compulsion or to collect a paycheck, although it says that, you know, a, a, a teacher is worthy of his keep or whatever. The bigger issue is, is if God has grabbed that pastor and shepherd to look over a particular flock appointed to them, give them reason to do this, shepherding you, leading you, watching over your soul as to one who has to give an account. Let them do it with joy and not with sorrow. And then it says, that would certainly not be for your benefit. It would not be to your benefit to cause your leader, the one God has assigned to shepherd you and pastor you and watch over your soul, it would not be to your benefit to not follow this command because there is a critical relationship that God has ordained and it only happens when you find your pastor and the one that you know God has assigned to your life and listen to a good example of what that type of leader should be in Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 15. It says, I will give you shepherds who are loyal to me, and they will shepherd you with knowledge and skill. You need to find a shepherd, a pastor that you know has a heart for God, that loves God and loves God's people. And can I tell you, you should be able to know that in your heart. You should be able to discern that. There shouldn't be a doubt about it. If you've got a question mark, then you probably haven't found your leader and haven't found your church. But when you know there's that connection and you know that there is someone who you can see by their fruit that they're loyal to God and that you sense a prompting, that's who you're to connect with, then you know your church. And then you know the re the rest of the story, which is you're to, to follow that that leader. You're supposed to, you know, I'm even reluctant to say it because of our culture. You're to obey that leader and do what they say. That's the reality when you find the one that you know is loyal to God. If they're doing it for, there's a phrase in the King James, filthy lucre. <laughs> I think it means greed. I think it means for all the wrong reasons, basically. Then you, then you need to keep moving on. But once you find that one that is committed to shepherd with knowledge and skill and that is loyal to God, you have found your pastor. You have found your church. And the scripture is clear that membership exists. How do I know this? Because if you look at Matthew chapter 18, Jesus outlines how people in the church, in the body of Christ, are to be held accountable on how they live. In Matthew 18, it talks about how Jesus says, if you find fault against someone in the body, you are to go confront them one-on-one. -on -one. But if they don't change their way or address the sin or the thing that is wrong among them, you bring another person, what? From the body to them. And if they still don't listen, do you know what it says next? This is Jesus talking. Go tell the elders of the church. It's in the Bible, 1 Corinthians chapter 5. There was a there was an issue that Paul confronted in the church that this man was committing horrific act of sexual immorality um, with his father's wife. And they were not only allowing it, but they were endorsing it. Paul says, you are so proud of yourselves, but you should be mourning in sorrow and shame. And you should remove this man from your fellowship. Do you see accountability? Do you see commitment? But I hope you also see as we continue, there is so much blessing to be connected to the local church. But sadly, many, uh, you know, in today's culture, it's, it's, it's really more about what I feel like doing when it comes to church. What makes me comfortable? Whether I like the music or not. Whether the preaching, you know, I, I like what some say when they're leaving my church. Well, I'm just not fed. Well, is it because the word is what you don't want to hear? Or is it something that you're looking for a word every Sunday that just makes you feel better? A little, a little, a spiritual jump start, if you will. You know, just a pep talk, <laughs> a, 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 you know, a rally before the football game. 
No, but there are so many blessings and benefits. So let me give you three things about membership. And if I had to sum it all up in one word, church membership, one word, it's about commitment. It's commitment. Let me first of all give you the reasons to become a member. I already discussed at length the biblical reason. If you look at Jesus, even in the 99 uh, sheep who he was concerned to go care for that one, that implies a number that is in that particular fold. And if you look at how he confronted that church in, at Corinth with the immorality and placing them out, if they would not ch change and see that individual come to repentance. But then we see also in Ephesians 5 and 25, Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. Boy, if that's not enough to see the, the importance that God places on the church, Jesus died for the church, shed his blood for the church, loves his church as his own bride. So there's not only a biblical reason to become a member, but there's a cultural reason. Can I just tell you, it is an antidote for our society. Very few want to commit to anything these days. They don't want to commit to their jobs. You got drive through divorce. You can, you, you even putting a future event two days ahead on our calendar is hard for some of us. We don't want to commit to anything. And can I tell you, becoming a church member, I'm going to say this as a word of encouragement, but it also is one that may, may, may be hard for you, is that one of the most unselfish things you can do is become a member of a local church. And when you hear more of this, you'll see that here is an opportunity for you to be completely unselfish when you step forward and join a local church. It, it implies commitment, and, and it's a cultural reason, but there, there's a practical reason as well. I mean, when you see him talk about the body with different parts, the practical reason is every, every team has a roster. You know, every school keeps track of its enrollment. People have a hard time with churches keeping track of numbers, you know, but if you look at it, all throughout the New Testament, there were 12 disciples, 70 disciples. There were, you know, 5,000 fed, 4,000 fed. There were 120. There was, you know, 3,000 led to Christ in Acts. Then 4,000. Numbers mattered. There were numbers of poor and widows on the roll, the church roll to care for those people. Th things are tracked so you don't lose the one among the 99. You see what I'm saying? This is... Do you see how this all implies membership? It all implies organization, tracking, knowing about people, caring for everyone, whether they're going astray or need accountability or whatever. It's, it's keeping track. It's knowing when someone isn't there. And the way we do that in the modern world is through some types of membership. When you know who's on the team, you know what you're working with. Even when it comes to serving in the local church and doing what we're called to do, you know, some are called to the gift of hospitality. Some are called to the gift of prayer. Some are called to the gift of preaching and teaching. Some are called to the gift of serve, service. These are all absolutely essential gifts. But if we don't know who's on the team, it's very difficult to move along and certainly not a healthy body that's accomplishing God's plan. We see, lastly, a personal reason. A personal reason is because it produces spiritual growth. There's accountability. There's mutual care and responsibility. Um, you get consistent teaching from a local church. And when you found your pastor, I've said this before, it's not just any preaching that you would just click online. You're knit up to a spiritual body where your pastor is doing his best to connect with God and then being able to connect what he's hearing with the people. You see what I'm saying? So it's it's a matter of then the word that comes forth should resonate with those that are in that particular local body because God cares about that as if it were a living organism and he wants to nourish and care for not only the collective body but each individual part therein. And so you can testify sometimes where you've been listening to a message and you're saying, man, pastor was, was at, my, he bugged my house this week. But that's because God cares so much about this church and he cares so much about you as a committed part of it that he'll speak to you, your specific situation, just to let you know that 
He loves you, and he loves you being a part of his church family. So what do we see? Um, what does a committed member of the church look like? Well, three things I want to give you there. They repent and are baptized for the forgiveness of sins. Well, some of you are saying, well, I'm already a member then. Well, you got to stay with me. That is a critical first part because Acts chapter 2 really gives us an outline of what a healthy church looks like. And that is a first requirement. Why we taught on baptism was because pretty much what this text says, when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. That's the first thing. Now, this, is, this might throw some people, but the first step of church membership is to repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of sins. Because to be a part of the body, to be baptized into the body, requires you to be a true follower of Jesus Christ. If you are attending the church to be curious about God and faith in God, that is why it's open to everyone. And it is ultimately a hospital for sick people. But when it comes to funneling this down in that, that, that word commitment, it's to people who are true believers in Christ and who are baptized because that's how the church is structured. They heard the word. They were cut to the heart. They asked the leader, what are you to do? Peter said, repent and be baptized. Every one of you, not just the ones that wanted to, every one of you be baptized and receive the forgiveness of sins. That's how you enter into this body. So not only is repentance and baptism critical to becoming a member, but also they seek after study, and submit themselves to the Word of God. I've alluded to some of this already, but listen to what it says in Acts 2.42. It says, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. And so you see there, they were devoted. It wasn't casual. They were devoted. And it was a regular, in that case, it was daily they were gathering together. And they were devoted to the apostles' teaching. They were hungry for the word. Not only for the word, but they also, they were, they were studying it and submitting to it and that it was the apostles that were doing the teaching. They were hearing and heeding the word. And, and, and so we see that a second characteristic is they seek after, study, and submit themselves to the word of God. But they also care for, connect, and pray regularly with other believers. Listen to what it says. It says they were in fellowship, right? The breaking of bread. And it says they were in prayer regularly when they were gathering just as much in the teaching of the word and the breaking of the bread was prayer. And look what happened as a result. Verse 43, everyone was filled with awe and many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers then... To, the awe caused them to be filled with worship. And it was not just worship in the sense of lifting hands. If you go back to Genesis and look at the first time the word worship is used, it was spoken of when, when God tested Abraham to be willing to take his son Isaac up to Mount Moriah and sacrifice him. And he told his boys at the bottom of the mountain when he was going to be obedient in sacrificing his son Isaac, he said, guys, I'm going up to worship. In his mind, that meant being willing to sacrifice his son. So when they gathered and were in awe in Acts 2 of what the apostles were teaching, of the miracles that were going forth, of the love that they were experiencing in fellowship and community, they were willing to worship in the form of sacrifice. It says, all the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. In other words, and this is a quality of the church that so many struggle with. They were generous. They had a radical generosity. They, their stewardship was everything I have from, is from God. And it was a generosity that flowed out of their amazement at what God was doing in their church. Did you see that? They're gathering together daily, food, the word prayer, fellowship. And, they, and when they saw what was happening, 
they were just everything they had. They called it common and wanted to help whatever they could, anyone else in need. You know, at the end of the day from these verses, think about it. A committed church member has certain characteristics outlined here in Acts chapter 2. They had focus. They were committed regularly to the apostles' teaching. They weren't going to be casual about it. They were going to make sure that they were hearing what the apostle was teaching. And they, they had fellowship. They were with other believers on a regular basis. And can I tell you, they would have noticed in those house churches if that person wasn't there because they valued so much that individual's personality, their gifts, what they brought to the table. There was focus and fellowship, but there was fun. Listen to what it says in Acts 2 verse uh, 46. It says, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart. Do you see they were, they were having fun? Are you kidding me? When you get together and you get connected with a church family, you start to let your guard down a little bit. You get to know each other's personality quirks. Somebody on here knows what. You even get to know pastors, little little, little things that he's got, you know, his little uh, things he says and quirks and, and whatnot. We, we have fun with each other. We become a family, right? We become to where, you know, you can go and just enjoy each other. Anyone who tells you church is boring, they haven't really connected with a healthy body that is embracing the journey with other people. They're focused. They have fellowship. They have fun. But it says they have favor. Listen, when they were committed and humbling themselves to the apostles' teaching and staying connected in community and having fun, it says praising God and having favor with all the people. I've told you time and time again that favor falls on those who are committed to God and his purpose in the earth and what he wants to do through your life. We'll look at Haggai one day again where the, the, the at some point where the believers had neglected uh, the building of the temple for many years because they were focused so much more on their own lifestyles and their own homes and their own creature comforts. And God was putting holes in their pockets because they weren't focusing on his house, his temple. But when they were connected here in Acts 2 like this, with this heart and reverence and awe and worship, there was favor with the people. Anybody need any favor? I don't know about you, but I have discovered that favor falls as I continue to keep my eyes and my focus on him and his will for my life and with God's people. But then we see fruitfulness. It says, the Lord was adding to their number day by day, those who were being saved. And that's what I want you to get from this second point of committed church members and their characteristics is that the last thing you'll see is if you're committed to the local church, there'll be fruitfulness. You'll have fruit in your life. You'll have evidence in your life that you're truly a believer and that you're truly committed because of what God does in and through you with your gifts in the local church. So the last thing I want to share with you is not only the reasons to become a member and what does a committed member look like, but as it relates to Perimeter Point Church and should for all local churches, I want to give you clearly as we move forward in this membership process, I want to talk about what are my responsibilities as a church member. First thing that is a responsibility of every church member. Once they've gone through this process, determined that they're gonna be a member, the first thing you've got to determine and purpose in your heart is, I will protect the unity of my church. What does this mean? It means acting loving toward one another. It means refusing to gossip. You know, if there's issues that arise in the church, Matthew 18 again, you take it up one-on-one. -on -one that doesn't work, you discreetly bring another person alongside, but you don't just talk it up about other people. You address things in love and, and, and don't allow gossip to spread. You don't, you don't say, praise the Lord, all is well, great sermon pastor, and then in the parking lot, you start talking all kinds of the opposite stuff, right? And then, and then uh, you know, that's the first thing because it says in Romans 14 and 19, so then let us aim for harmony in the church and try to build each other up. Do you know, don't we get enough beat downs from life everywhere else? This is 
This is the, the place where we find that refuge, that rest, that comfort, that encouragement. When you come to the church, there should be a harmony and it should be a key objective of that church to build one another up. That's why Hebrews says, let us not forsake the assembly of ourselves together because that's where we are to be in the presence because your gift, my gift come together and we build each other up, encourage one another. So you are you if you're going to be a member of Perimeter Point Church, you protect the unity of your church. But number two, you share the responsibility. Say, I will share the responsibility of my church. What does this mean? It means that you will not only pray for its growth, but you will look for ways to help grow the church. Acts 2, they added to the church daily those that were being saved. It's not just a pastor who has a heart to see spiritual growth and transformation and the church growing. No, it it's you having a heart and intentionally inviting the unchurched to attend. It's doing those shares and watch parties, but it's also personally inviting and being willing to drive people to church when we get back into a building. It's being intentional and seeing one of your critical assignments as a member of your church is to invite and present a warm and welcoming environment where people that you've invited are coming in and becoming a part of the family that you love and that you receive spiritual enrichment from. So number two, I will share the responsibility of my church. Number three, I will serve the ministry of my church. The way that we do this, and we'll have a whole, a whole lesson on this in the new membership class, is you will discover your spiritual gifts and exercise them in the body. You know, for all we know, you're an arm that we're missing in our church, a perimeter point, and we need that arm. You know, so we've got to discover your gift and then get you connected so that our body is functioning at full capacity. But then not only discovering your gifts, but then we as a core team need to equip you to be able to serve and to exercise those gifts. And we need also, if we're committing to be a member and serve the ministry, we need to develop a servant's heart, right? Philippians 2, 4 says, Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also the interests of others. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, taking the very nature of a servant. So to model, follow our model Christ, we we, we don't look after our own interests. It's the opposite. I said membership is one of the most unselfish acts you can make in the modern world. But number four, I will support the testimony of my church. Or I will support the mission of my church. How do you do that? Number one, number one, by attending your church faithfully and regularly. But number two, by living a godly life. That's only possible, as we talk about in Life Group, we were covering this on Thursday, if we don't have accountability, a regular intake of God's Word, praying like we do, we're liable to get right off track quick and, and find ourselves way off the rails. But we choose to connect and hold each other accountable because we know, what is it, idle hands or the devil's workshop? You know, and when you get in isolation, it's where he can he can start to do tricks on your mind and start getting you in the wrong place. We strive to live a godly life, and that's why we become members, because it helps us to do what God has commanded us to do with that. But then third, I will support the mission of my church by giving regularly. That is clearly outlined that we must have that radical generosity I mean, in the early Acts church, they all put everything out on the table and anybody who had a need, they got what they needed. What it is saying to us is that we should have a heart. Listen what it says in 1 Corinthians 16 and 2. On the first day of each week, you should each put aside a portion of the money you have earned. Don't wait until I get there and then try to collect it all at once. It is an intentional, disciplined systematic, generous, purposeful giving that helps sustain the local church, that a member 
by saying I'm a member. I'm committed and believe in the mission that this church is carrying forth. And I support it not just with my mind and with my presence, but with my pocketbook. It is a priority in my life. If you looked at my bank account, if you look at what comes in, you will see that I have a priority in my life, which is the mission of the church for which I was purchased by Christ's blood to be a part of and to share that with others. And it is with the resources that I contribute that that mission goes forward. The greatest mission that I'm a part of in my entire life. So when we discover all these things, church, that I will protect the unity of my church, I will share the responsibility of my church, I will serve the ministry of my church, I will support the mission of my church, we will start seeing Perimeter Point Church add to its church daily those that are being saved because they see and it a committed group, focused, fun, family, fellowship, favor, and fruitfulness. They will see that and they will want to be a part of it. But it's got to start with a heart to want to know him. So if you haven't given your life to Jesus Christ, I want to invite you, even in this membership, in this membership class, to consider surrendering your life to Christ today. And you can pray a prayer with me. And then also, you'll start to get next steps on how you move toward a fully committed member of a local church. But pray, with, pray this with me, dear Lord. I've heard this message and I realize not only do I not have a church that I'm committed to, I don't even have a deep relationship with you. I want to know you and I believe that Jesus gave his life for me, died on the cross for me, forgave me my sin so that I can be in a relationship with you. And God, I thank you for your forgiveness, and I desire to grow in my faith. Now help me to commit to my church to grow as a member and to fulfill your purpose for my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, God bless you. Whatever step you took, always want to invite you to fill out the Connect With Us link and don't put it off. You know, if, if God prompted you to make any decision as a result of hearing this lesson, this message, you need to make a decision to, to, to tell someone right away. And, the, and submitting that link is a way that you can take a step of faith that will be met with another instruction of faith that you can take and another and another. God says to walk by faith and not by sight. So whatever next step he gave you, be assured that he will give you the grace to not only take that step, but steps ahead of that that will blow your mind when you start seeing how he wants to use you for his, for his kingdom and glory. God bless you. Well, I just want to say again how much I appreciate each of you joining us today at Perimeter Point. And uh, as my former pastor used to say, I don't think there's anybody mad but the devil because we're talking from the biblical perspective of what it means to be a member and in that it implies commitment. But then when commitment comes to a local church, uh, the, the kingdom starts advancing. And of course, the enemy's not happy with that. But the fact is, if you're with me all the way here to this part, you're already halfway there in terms of being the, the member that God has called you to now learn about and commit to on a deeper level. It's time to step it up. That's all. That's the challenge for all of us. But I thank God for you staying with us this entire time. And I want to thank you even now for all of your generosity and the gifts and contributions that you have contributed to this church. This church has been able to do some incredible things in global missions, in outreach in our local community. But I've got a, a particular uh, opportunity that we found out about a few weeks ago that the Lord has laid on our heart to be an engaged partner with. And my wife, Doris, wants to tell you about it. Hey, this is Doris Kratt. I went on a walk today already. One mile is really not that much, not for me and not for a lot of us. And so walking one mile for us may not be very much, but it can be life-saving for other people and little babies too.
According to the National Pediatric Cancer Foundation, only 4% of the billions of dollars that are annually spent on cancer research and treatments are directed toward treating childhood cancer. Only 4% of billions? Hello, our children are our future. And so we're trying to help here with that. We're trying to help here. Andy is a precious little boy who happens to be the nephew of our beloved Shelby. Um, so we want to be a blessing to Shelby and Shelby's family and especially little Indy and all of the little children who unfortunately um, have have had to dealt, deal with cancer. Um, and so Indy was diagnosed with stage three Wilms tumor at three months old. And his parents felt that they should do their part in raising money for childhood cancer research and for families affected by childhood cancer. And that is why they created the Indy Race. I know you might be thinking, well, I don't, I don't want to be in a race. There's COVID-19, da 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 da, all this stuff. It's a virtual race, okay? It's a virtual race, so you can do it right in your neighborhood. Just like I'm standing here talking, and I walked around the neighborhood with my husband. You can do this virtual race for the lives of so many precious little children. You can do it right in your neighborhood or you can do it inside of your house on a treadmill. It doesn't really matter. Okay, so here's how it works. The Indy Race has a $22 entry fee. And um, you basically can sign up for that, pay the $22 or whatever, or you can just donate if you're like, I don't walk, I don't bike ride, I don't jog, I don't swim. Um, Cause there are multiple ways that you can do this. Um, you can donate money or you can pay the $22 and do it yourself. The first race is July the 1st. That's coming up. And if you do a one mile simple basic walk, um, you don't have to train for it. <laughs> the later in August, on August the 5th, there is a 5K. And in September, now you might have to warm up for that or practice for that or something. Um, again, walk, jog, cycling, swimming, whatever it may be. Um, and then in September, it's Childhood Cancer Awareness Month and it's a 10K. So the bottom line is, is you can participate, you can contribute toward, and you can help save lives for these beautiful little children. I just urge you to take part in it or donate toward it um, in support of Indy and in support of our church family member, Shelby. Thank you. I'm really excited about doing this. In fact, uh, the Kratz have already committed to doing the one mile walk and you can check out the schedule so you know when it is. And I would love to see many of us virtually do this one mile walk and we can get on uh, some group chat or something along the way while we're walking this thing out. Um, but I hope you'll register for that uh, one mile walk at least. There's a couple other opportunities. But I'm also excited uh, to be able to say that Perimeter Point Church, resources that you have generously contributed have done things in South Africa, Romania, Haiti, here in Atlanta in so many ways. We are gonna personally contribute. We're believing many of you are gonna join us in that one, in that, uh, one mile walk on July 1st. And we thank God for your participation. We again remind you of the different ways to give are there on your screen. And as you're doing that, let me also give a couple of shout outs. Thank God we celebrated finally in drive through form uh, Grant's graduation. What an incredible opportunity for us to go by and, and have a little parade, a little honking and encouragement to Grant who graduated from high school, heading off to college with scholarship. We are just so proud of him as a church family. Um, and way to go on Father's Day, seeing Greg, of course, Tanisha, what you've done with all your kids is just amazing. I also wanted to give a shout out. I don't know if we did this, but happy birthday, sweet 16 to Greer. If I've done it already, I don't care. I'm going to wish you a happy birthday again and again and again. All right. So happy, happy birthday. We celebrate you on this day. And uh, of course, shout out again 
to all of our fathers that are watching this and make sure you share this with them so that they can know how much we celebrate them today. Last but not least, a uh, little bit later today, we are going to have a baptism in my backyard. A young man by the name of Solomon wanted to get scripturally baptized. He heard the message on this past Sunday, and he's going to take that leap of faith, and we're going to baptize him today on Facebook Live. So I hope you'll keep an eye out for that on our Perimeter Point chip page. But listen, it's been a joy to be with you here today. Keep taking the steps that we've been presenting on membership. And when the time comes, we'll have an opportunity to have a covenant signing ceremony and, and really pull together and celebrate what the Lord has done in bringing this unique people together for such a time as this. Great things are to come. God bless you.